In this video, I'm going to attempt to take these 200-year-old heartwood pine beams from a Chattanooga warehouse and transform them into a conference table for a very important client. I've never attempted a table like this, and this is the most I've ever been paid for a project. I have little margin for error, a short deadline, and I really hope he likes the final product. So if you want to see what happens when you say yes to a project you've never attempted before and don't own the tools needed to pull it off, stick around. Nothing can go wrong, right? Now let's start with the good news. The client agreed to a price of $3,500, which is the most I've ever charged for a project. Now I was shocked when he said yes, especially because the other guy quoted him $2,800. The even better news is I don't have to spend money on lumber. He's providing the beams that are leftover scraps from his home renovation. Now with the price of lumber right now, this is a huge win and should be the most profitable thing I've ever done. And if you're curious on how much profit I actually make from this, stick around. I will reveal my time invested and my cost. But it's not all rainbows and sunshine, children. There's only three of these beams and they need to be resawed. And I've never resawed before, and I don't have a bandsaw that can resaw. I only have this cute Harbor Freight toy that shudders at the thought of cutting cardboard. I'm also not sure we will have enough wood to make the size table he requires. And I don't want to get in a situation where I'm trying to match the tone of this wood with lumber that I would need to buy. He wants the table to be six feet long, and these are not six feet long. Oh, and I only have 10 days to complete it. He wants to use this for an upcoming board meeting he is hosting for a national cancer nonprofit. So now I'm feeling the pressure and I can't mess this up. But first, I need to find a bandsaw. Step one, find a bandsaw for $10. One of the challenges of this project is there's several tools that I need to pull off this in the best way possible. This is where the natural response is to go buy the tool, but I'm refraining to do that for three reasons. First, I wanna keep a lot of this money. B, I don't have the space for more tools, and Roman numeral three, I want to demonstrate to you that with some imagination and some leaning on others, it is possible to say yes to projects like this without having a shop full of tens of thousands of dollars of tools. So many times on YouTube, people say, well, I could do that too if I had $20,000 in tools. And the answer is no, you could do that too if you knew how to get access to $20,000 worth of tools. So here's what I did. I first checked out this website called makerbook.io. Some no-name beginner YouTuber created it as a way to help people find shops near them that they can rent. And I found a few shops in my area that listed that they had a bandsaw and seemed to be solid options. But I ended up going with a different maker space that I found that wasn't on MakerBook for one very important $1,200 reason that will become clear later on in the video. The old school maker space in San Antonio rents three hours for $10. Three hours, $10. Are you kidding me? They also have a saw stop and a capex. I figured for $3.33 an hour, it sounds like a nice test drive. Bandsaw secured, hot dogs in jeopardy. Step two, refuse to do math or draw. I'm honestly nervous that I might mess this up, waste this wood and waste my time, and worse, not be able to deliver on a project that I said yes to. And so, instead of sketching this out and doing a bunch of math, I decided I'm just gonna pay someone else to do it. I've got $3,500, right? So I went on Fiverr, not sponsored by the way, and I found a guy who quoted me $25 to take my measurements of these beams and digitally in SketchUp or something like that, come up with the table. I thought paying a guy 25 bucks to build the table on the computer before I even take a saw to it was a good deal. And here's what he came up with. He even showed me where the different pieces of the beams would go and gave me a 3D rendering based on the legs I plan to buy from General Specific. I mean, semi-exact. They look beautiful, and the best part is I don't have to do anything other than screw them on. Plans in hand, time to build. Step three, resaw like a virgin. Before I head over to the makerspace, I need to remove any nails that are sleeping in this wood. I'm sure the bandsaw blades and saw stop cartridge that I don't own would appreciate that. I bought this metal detector off Amazon and it actually saved my bacon. Now while there were nails I could find, there were a couple of nails that I missed, but this little guy barked at me and told me, no Drew, those are not knot holes, that's a nail. Now while I was getting these nails out, a crisis almost occurred. I really like this Boris Centipede work 
work table that I bought in the summer. It sets up fast and I was using it so I didn't have to work on the floor. But I was so excited to get started on this project, I decided to not attach the MDF top with the screw clamps. And as I was hammering away, I didn't notice that the top was slipping and moving from side to side. And it was about a quarter of an inch away from falling, taking this 200 year old dense heavy beam with it, most likely on my unprotected toes. So I ended up moving to the floor to work and later swapped out my five year old paper thin sketchers for proper leather work boots that have a hard toe for protection. Side note, I just found out that I had the same boots as the best woodworking influencer on Instagram, Tom Silva, and I think that's pretty cool. Well, not that cool. I really like the company that makes these boots and how they name their products after army vets and people in the trades, and if they're good enough for Tom Freak and Silva, I guess they're good enough for a guy like me. When I toured the makerspace and decided to do this project there, I noticed they were missing some things that would have made life easier for me and people that come after me. So I bought some in-feed and out-feed roller stands to assist at the bandsaw and they turned out to be great. I also noticed that they didn't have any smart vacuum switches and since their table saw and their dust collector were on two different circuits, this would be a huge convenience and time saver if the makerspace had these. I bought these for my shop and I love them. And with the makerspace only charging me $3.33 an hour, I think I can give them a little more than that and donate all of this stuff so that they can have it. I was really excited to try to resaw something for the first time. Robert, who runs the makerspace, was nice enough to show me around and we did some test pieces before I got off to the races. I thought I'd be smart and draw layout lines on the board after we set up the fence. And it's hard to see, but if we pause it, you can look at this measurement. It should be one and three quarter inches, but I'm drawing a line at one and three eighth inches. Remember that kids, it's going to cause a lot of problems later. And I mean a lot of problems. Don't worry, the camera is off when I was cursing. Now as I started resawing, because this is such dense material, and maybe all bandsaws do this, I don't know, I'm a bandsaw virgin, remember? I was getting a lot of drift and wasn't getting as smooth and consistent slices like I wanted. Now these boards need to be as thick as possible so I can route C channel in the bottom. But I made some big mistakes, especially when this bandsaw started drifting and I didn't know how to maneuver it. I got really, really, really scared. I can't emphasize how stressed I got that I was already screwing this project up and there was no margin for error. After blundering three of these slices and not getting any better, I had an idea and I think I should have done this from the beginning. The idea was to rip a groove down the center of these beams at the table saw by flipping them end over end. So I looked at that shiny new three horsepower saw stop that I've never used before and I ripped a two inch groove on each side. From there, I took it back to the bandsaw and freehanded the final cut with no issues. And I gotta say, this worked awesome. I don't know if this is the standard way to do stuff like this because like I said, I've never resawed before, but this worked out great for me. The cool thing about this is before I did all of this, we jointed and planed all the sides on their Powermatic jointer. Oh my, have you ever used a Powermatic? Now I get it, it was super nice. Now once we had cut these open with the bandsaw, all we needed to do was roll them through the planer, do some minor tweaks, and my boards are basically done. Now this is the part where I could get an idea of how the material was going to look and how the pieces would fit together, and I started to get a little bit excited, if you can get excited about the look of pine. Now I noticed there were some chairs in the corner, and I just remember the client stressing that he wanted to seat six people around it. So I grabbed some chairs, and I was able to visualize the reality of six chairs around it. I took some video and pictures and sent it to him and got the approval to keep going, which is great because I need the money. Now after I got the thumbs up, I noticed we had a thickness problem. Remember me measuring about half an inch wrong earlier? Yeah. The new boards that I cut using the table saw method are perfect, but the first boards that I cut are super thin and I don't want to plane down the entire table to that thickness. So after getting some lunch, I figured probably the best course of action given the time frame is to go to Lowe's and buy some white pine. I can't believe I'm saying this. It was terrible, 60 bucks, gross. I wanna throw up. And so the plan is to laminate these on the bottom of the thin pieces and hide those pieces in the middle. And if I do a 45 degree bevel cut on the edges, you'll never see that part of this heartwood pine table is actually cheap white pine from Lowe's, right? That's a good plan, that's gonna work, right? 
We're now at day three and it's the last day at the Makerspace and I was getting really nervous at this point about the thickness of the top because I want to route C channel into the bottom because that's what everyone on YouTube does and I want to be a good YouTuber. So as I squared up the edges and was making final decisions on where all the pieces would fit, I was wondering about the best way to join these butt joints together so I could hit the six foot mark the client is looking for. I thought about doing dowels and I thought about doing uh, something like a half lap joint. I thought about getting a finger joining bit. Trigger alert. Then out of the corner of my eye, I noticed something gleaming. A Festool Domino. Oh my. Step four, trigger the Festool haters with a domino. I told you this is a build video on YouTube. You think Rubio Monaco will make an appearance later? Now I've never used a domino. I've heard that people love them and hate them, but I wanted to see for myself and for $10 for every three hours, why not? So I called the director over. He gave me a quick tutorial on how to use it. I still don't understand, but he set it up perfectly and said, go to town. And I did. I not only went to town, I went home. And this is the proof that the old school makerspace in San Antonio is the best makerspace in the world. He let me borrow the domino so I could spend more time in my shop and be more efficient. Now, to be fair, I don't think he lets anyone else borrow the domino, but he let me borrow the domino. And actually, it's still in my garage. Shh, don't tell him. And now I get it. This thing is nice. And this is why I chose this makerspace over the makerbook.io ones. Sorry, Cam. Now from here on out, I'm gonna be spending the rest of this project in my shop because I have everything I need to finish it. I could have technically done it at the makerspace, but I just wanted to do it in my space. You know that feeling when you're on vacation after three days and you're just ready to be in your own bed? It was kind of like that. I wanted my own crappy rigid table saw with the suspect fence. I'm just kidding, I missed their saw stop. So my plan with the domino was to glue up the panels in two sections at a time and then run those through the planer 24 hours later when the glue is cured. And when those are flat, which only took a few passes, I domino other pieces together and I keep doing that until I ran out of planer space. And if you see my planer, you know it happened really, really quick. But as crappy as this planer is, it worked. And by the end of day six, I was able to glue up all the panels and finally have one tabletop that would kind of work in meet the client's requirements. At this point, it was time to clean the glue squeeze out and I used a combination of a Harbor Freight screwdriver, I mean chisel, a card scraper, and my $575 Festool sander. Has a Harbor Freight chisel and Festool sander ever worked so closely together? I think not. Step five, cut a 45 degree bevel without hurting myself. This is one of my favorite parts of the project when I get my beloved track saw out to square off the ends. And one of the things that I really love about having a track saw is these TSO guide rail squares. Now TSO is a partner to my channel, but I paid for this a long before they knew who I was. I love this thing. It turns your track into a precision square and it makes things easier. I don't even mark or measure most of the time. I just line things up. I get a perfect 90 degree cut every time. Now here's a sad story. Five years ago, someone broke into our house and stole $3,000 worth of my tools. I had a new rigid trim router that was taken and I literally cried. Like I seriously sat on the grass outside the broken window and I cried. It was one of the best days of my life because it gave me a reason to buy a cordless Makita router. I love this thing, especially when you pair it with this red aluminum plate from woodpeckers that they sent me for free to review. I'm just kidding. It's not from woodpeckers. They don't know who I am. I bought this on Amazon for $16 and it's no name, but I like it. Now, if you notice in the 3D mockups, I wanted to try something I've never tried and that is to put this 45 degree bevel cut or a chamfer on the bottom of the table. One, because I think it looks cool and two, I think it could help hide the crappy pandemic pine that I got from Lowe's to fix my bandsaw mistake. Now, my original thought when I worked this out in my head was that I would place the workpiece on its face and I'd be able to cut from the bottom. That seemed to be the easiest and safest way to do it until I noticed that my saw tilts the opposite way. So that means I had no choice but to cut from the top, which means that the guide rail is going to have to hang over off of the top in the air and it'll be a challenge to measure and get consistent cuts. I really wondered, one, how safe is this? And two, how accurate is this going to be? Now, it was the end of day six. I was tired and I was really scared that I was going to massively mess something up. So I did what any wise person would do. Instead of pushing ahead, I stopped for the day to rest and to think. 
I raised my hand for help and I asked Full Rise and Blacktail Studio what they've done in these situations. They shared their thoughts with me and gave me some great pointers, so thanks guys. I don't care what the trolls say about you, you're all right. The beginning of day seven, I was bright-eyed and bushy-tailed with a fresh mind and I went out and brought the table off the ground and onto my Ron Pock bench that I built and I used my favorite ratchet clamps in the world to clamp the track to the top. And with Cam's help, I figured out that basically if I hang the track over half an inch, I will get the bevel right where I want it to be. And so after doing this on a test piece, I was able to do this on the real piece and boy was that nerve wracking. And here's a little pro tip that I got from Cam. Put some painter's tape on the very end and support the off cut with your hand so that it doesn't break off and splinter when you get to the end. It worked perfectly. And after never doing this before, I was actually surprised at how well this turned out for my first time. Now if I were to do this over again, here's what I would do. I would still do this track saw method, but I would also get a massive 45 degree bit from CMT. And I would use that as a final pass. Basically, one of the challenges with using a track saw is it's hard to get all these lines to match up as you go around the workpiece. But if you use a router bit, you can get a perfect line all the way around. But taking off that much material with a handheld router is pretty crazy. So the theory is you do most of the work with the track saw and then you come up at the end and you flush everything out with a router bit. At this point, I was feeling so good about this project and was feeling like I was conquering challenges easily. I thought I could finish the next day and boy was I wrong. And I'm not going to lie, this last section kicked my butt. Step six. Don't listen to Suman. I've always wanted to route C-channel into the bottom of a table. And I know there's a lot of debate out there on wood movement, but I think doing something like this is really good insurance to keep wood flat. I recently saw an interesting video by Suman where he tested metal threaded inserts versus just tapping threads directly into wood. The surprise of that video was that threading directly into wood was actually stronger than metal inserts. So I thought, Simon's a YouTuber and an Instagram influencer with 108 fickle followers. He would never steer me wrong. So I put all my eggs in his basket, all 3,500 of them, and I went out and bought my first thread tapper thingy for $4. The fact that I don't know the name of the bit should probably have been the first clue that something was going to go bad. I was so excited I went out and bought this Milescraft portable drill press thingy because the Rockler and Woodpecker ones are, let's just say, slightly more expensive. And in case you're wondering, if I had to do it over again, and I guess with Amazon I technically can do it over again, I'd get the Rockler one. This Milescraft did the job, but the depth stop doesn't work on it, and it feels like it belongs at Harbor Freight. And after touching the Rockler one in person last week, the difference is night and day. After some test threads on some expensive leftover pandemic pine I had laying around, I decided to go for it and it was a disaster. The threads I tried to tap worked at first, but after removing the bolt a few times, the threads loosened up and it was a no-go. Thanks, Simon. I'm kidding. I don't think it was Simon leading me astray, although he is a YouTuber and that's entirely possible. On pine? You might as well tap threads into cheese. But I think the pine was too soft or I'm just a noob. I think the latter is probably more true and maybe I was just drilling too fast. And after fighting with it and ruining one of the threads in the workpiece, I rushed to Woodcraft in a panic to get real metal inserts like a real YouTuber. I even got this cool threaded T-handle that you can use to insert your inserts and guess what? It conveniently broke the first time. I freaked out. Not only did I not know how to put threads into wood, but when I got the right tool for the right job, on the first use, the threaded shank snapped off in the insert. Thankfully, there's these little flathead notches that Drew Fisher would appreciate, and I was able to back it out with a screwdriver. Let's just say I'm not recommending these T-handled tools that use threads. Get the hex style instead. The strategy that proved to work was drill the hole with a brad point bit, slightly chamfer a relief, and then insert the inserts with some paste waxes lubrication. What started out as exciting and fun turned into a nightmare and then ended with some satisfaction. Now look at how flush that is. Oh, and you see that? That's not where I put the router edge guide on the wrong side of the router and accidentally drifted off the line. That's a bespoke detail. It's not a mistake, it's bespoke. Step seven, cut a hole in the top. Wait, I thought that was step one. After I started the table, my client randomly asked if there was a way to put a grommet in the middle of the table so that when he's having meetings, people could put their power cords through it. And I said, no, 
That's ridiculous. I'm not going to drill a hole in the center of this 200 year old wood. Let's put something in that's better. So the day after Christmas, while my wife and I were in the ER with our 14 month old who had the flu, I found this pop-up outlet thingy with a wireless charger on top. I showed it to the client and he loved it. Slightly better than a grommet. But there's an issue. It requires an 80 millimeter hole and I don't have an 80 millimeter hole saw but I do have a freaking laser beam sands the shark. Name that movie. Accounting for the guide bushing, I was able to figure out the offset and create my own template with a piece of quarter inch MDF scrap I had laying around. I used the blue painter's tape and CA glue trick. I'm just kidding, I'm a real woodworker. I used double-sided tape to attach the template to the table. Things worked out as expected, but I didn't have a router bit long enough to cut through the entire thickness of the top. So thinking fast, I drilled out some holes and roughed out and hogged out the material that was left in the middle. Then I flipped the top over and I used another router bit with a guide bushing that ran on the inside to flush everything up. I hope that makes sense. This is what two hours of routing will get you. Technically, I don't think it was two hours, but it sure did feel that way. Now, while I had the tabletop upside down and my laser fired up, I thought it'd be kind of cool to do a custom engraving on the bottom. So I took my logo, my client's name, my name, the year, and I made a custom made by badge. Hot branding irons were so 2022. I've always wanted to do something like this. And out of all of the lasers that you could get these days, the reason why I got this specific laser is that not only could I engrave things, but I could take this laser to things and engrave directly on them. Since I was in shark and laser beam mode, I asked the client if he had his favorite scripture that he would want engraved on the top. He lost his mind and quickly sent me one that he thought would work really well. And so that's what I did. I put a nice little subtle scripture right in the middle of the table. At this point, this was day seven or eight, and I was starting to get tired and a little bit worn down by all these challenges. And looking at the scripture to work hard for the Lord really kept me going. It was a great reminder that often I tend to work hard for the approval of people, even the approval of some of you on YouTube, and that's a terrible way to live your life. I think the greatest takeaway for me personally building this table was being reminded to work hard, but to work hard for the right audience. I guess this is not the appropriate time in the video to beg for your subscription or to ask for a like. That would be ironic. Step eight, pretend to be Cam from Blacktail Studio. Welcome to day nine. This is where it's gonna get interesting. I've always wanted to fill knot holes and cracks with CA glue because that's what every good YouTube video has. And I have this medium thick black CA glue from Starbon. I really had a fun time filling in some of these holes, but on the really large knot holes, I'd have a problem. When I would fill up the deep areas with CA glue and then spray activator, the top layer would crystallize, but the bottom wouldn't have a chance to cure. And then when I would puncture it, the glue would come out everywhere. So I had this brilliant idea of using this epoxy that Taytool sent me a long time ago to use in a video. Now I never made a video and I'd forgotten about it and so had they until this awkward moment right now, my bad. And this stuff looks really, really nice. And if you know anything about epoxy, you are probably typing in the comments right now, all caps, don't do it, Drew. And you'd be right if you had that thought. But guess what? You're two weeks too late. Yeah, I did it. I made the mistake of putting this type of epoxy in these knot holes. Ladies and gentlemen, I have a public service announcement. Not all epoxy is created equal. Immediately, I saw that this was not going the way I envisioned, and I saw all kinds of bubbles, hundreds of bubbles, and it wasn't clear, and it wasn't flowing well, and I thought, you're supposed to add heat, right? Well, I don't have a torch, but I have a heat gun. Turns out, it made it worse. It just dried faster and it looked like something that I'm not allowed to say on TV because this is supposed to be a family show. So in a panic, before it could cure, I removed as much as possible while thinking in the back of my head there was a chance that I just ruined this table. And if you take anything away from this video, please do not try to use this type of epoxy to fill in gaps. This is made for fastening things to each other, not for doing Blacktail Studio hacks. Now, if I were a better YouTuber, I would have saw this coming and I would have established an affiliate relationship with Total Boat. Next time, Total Boat. Next time. Now, I didn't think it would work, but I just put a certified butt ton of black CA glue in the holes to cover up the crappy epoxy job. And it turns out it was fine. Crisis averted. Step nine, 
finish him. Now, technically, I probably should have finished the table first before adding the legs, but I really wanted to see what this table would look like after spending a week making mistake after mistake after mistake. And after doing a lot of complicated math using a very, very expensive triangle, I figured out that this is the position of these legs. Good job, Chris Salamone. I love these legs. And so does everyone else who sees this table. They comment on your design, your legs, not the work that I did on the wood. Thank you. I'm unsubscribing from Four Eyes. Now for the finish coat, I thought of using Odie's oil because I know that's Lincoln Street's preferred finish. But given that he doesn't build anything on his channel and he only talks about batteries and life insurance, I decided to go with Rubio Monaco because this is a YouTube video, right? Now I reached out to Rubio a couple of times and I told them what I was doing and I asked them if I could get some free product because this stuff is freaking expensive. And they said, no. Seriously, apparently their policy is to not give out any free product to people, which on one hand I can kind of respect because if that's true, it means that when you see Rubio all over the YouTubes, it's because people actually paid for it. But after seeing that there's a thing called Rubio Ambassadors, I think that they may have just told a fib and just didn't want to work with me. So if you're keeping score, Rubio one, Drew zero. And if you've never used Rubio Monocoat, I highly recommend you try it. It's pretty great. Now this can was really expensive. I think 60 bucks for this can. But as they say, a little goes a long way. I tracked the milliliters that I used for this table and figured out that the cost was about $18 which to be fair is usually what I would spend on a crap can of polyurethane that I use once and then forget about and then it goes bad. So I figure if you're going to spend $20 to finish a table, don't use polyurethane, use this. Wait, is this a free advertisement for Rubio? Ugh. Rubio 2, Drew 0. My friend John Schieser told me about these buffing pads that he gets on Amazon. They're actually really expensive, but they fit on my sander and I'm able to buff out the excess without hurting my arm, which was a pretty awesome trick. Thanks, John. Big shout out to Jody from Inspire Woodcraft and Jason Bent from Bent's Woodworking. I watched their videos on Rubio to learn how to do this for my first time. Thanks guys, I appreciate it. Now here's the cost breakdown. This table took me 10 days to build. It should have taken me three, but when you take into account that I tried so many things I've never done before, including working out of someone else's space for three days, this time frame kind of makes sense. Also, recording a video in the style that I do while building the thing easily 3x the time commitment. I spent a total of $1,161.20 on all the materials I needed to complete the job, and I even ruined a bandsaw blade and two rolls of brand new sandpaper on a drum sander because that's what happens when you work with resinous pine. And when the client found out about this, he offered to pay me an additional $225 to cover those unforeseen costs in add-ons like his phone charger. He didn't have to do it, but it was pretty great. So all in all, I billed him for $3,725 and netted a little over $2,500 in profit. Not including videoing the project, I spent around 22 hours in actual woodworking over the course of 10 days because, you know, glue has to dry. And that gives me about $116 an hour, which is $111 more an hour than I made at my second job at McDonald's. As far as the deadline, the client came to pick it up hours before his first meeting with it, and we barely made it. But here is his first reaction seeing the table for the first time. Oh, Drew, that is fabulous. Oh, my. I love the inscription. Oh, this is just Some of you who've used a domino before might notice how I accidentally cut through a domino at the end of the table. Yeah, big mistake. Now you know how to fix it? It's easy. You just call it bespoke. 
After gushing over his new table, he surprised me with the world's best chicken, Chick-fil-A, and we got to use his table for the first time by eating lunch together. I've never done this with a client before, and I thought it was wicked awesome. Two chicken sandwiches later, I helped him deliver the table to its home, a second story loft in his car condo where he has business meetings and restores British cars. It was there where we met this suspicious red spiral staircase and were faced with the task of getting this table onto the second story. We debated taking the legs off and trying to carry it standing up, but after the sobering audit of my biceps, we found this. Well, that's one way you can do it. And this is the part of the video where the table that took me 10 days to build falls off the genie lift and is destroyed before it could even be used. I'm kidding, it worked out fine. Here it is in its final resting spot with a pretty cool LED light hanging above. The client could not be more happy, and if the client's happy, I'm happy. Stop. I'm not going to ask you to subscribe. I mean, you can if you want. But if you got value out of this video, and if, if there's someone in your life that you think could either get inspired or learn something from what I just showed you, would you consider sharing it with them? It would help grow this video and reach more people than I ever could on my own. Thanks for watching to the end. I applaud your attention span. Well done. On Pine? You might as well tap threads into cheese.